rags to riches story today about an untranslatable word and a book that no one wanted. Um, and it and the story kind of starts as I'm finishing college and I majored in English and Russian and I minored in creative writing and I had no idea what to do with any of that. Um, and my family had just moved to Iowa City and I found out about the MFA program that they have at the University of Iowa in literary translation and I thought, oh, that sounds like some way to combine the three things that I vaguely have some expertise in. So I signed up, I arrived, and just weeks before classes began, there was a small coup in the Slavic department at the University of Iowa, which tends to happen in Slavic departments around the country. Um, so someone was appointed to be the chair of the department that no one else cared for. So a number of people took uh, sabbaticals or went into early retirement or did something else to protest the um, horrible hiring choice that had been made, which meant that there were no Russian classes left for me to take as part of my uh, master's program in translation. So I simultaneously learned how to translate there and also learned a totally new language to me from a country that I knew absolutely nothing about. Poland. Um, and I had always been really passionate about finding contemporary women's writing and kind of being an advocate for women writers um, in whatever language. And Polish actually turned out to be really great for me because there was this vast canon of women's writing throughout the centuries and also new women's writing. So I was kind of starting to make my way through that. I was very excited, but I was also feeling a little bit daunted by all of the responsibility that this entailed. You know, taking someone else's words and then changing every single one of them into my words, words that I chose, and then putting it under that first person's name. That seems really intense. And nothing ever seemed to be right in my first translations. Like no word ever seemed to match perfectly what the original had said. And gradually I started to come to terms with the fact that everything is untranslatable. If what translation means is making something new that stays the same, but that's not what translation is. So I started working on a collection of short stories that I found at the university library by a woman named Olga Tukarchuk. And I, at the same time, applied for Fulbright, which I got, so I was able to do my due diligence and I moved to, to Warsaw. I went to the University of Warsaw for a year after my master's degree. I then lived in Krakow for a year. I met Olga. Um, and then I went and did a PhD in comparative literature, which focused on Polish literature, so I could make sure I understood you know, the whole context of what she was doing and what the other writers I was working with were doing. And in 2007, she published a novel that I absolutely fell in love with. And it was a kind of a strange novel. It was a departure for her called Biguni in Polish. So Biguni is not a common word in Polish at all. Um, you can tell grammatically because Polish is very specific in a way that English isn't, it used to be, but it lost a lot of its grammatical markers over time. You can tell that it refers to people from the ending and that it refers to men and women or just men um, and that they are the subject of the sentence. So nothing is being done to them um, that we know of. Biegun means a lot of different things. It means pole, like North and South Pole, not like Polish person. Um, it means rocker, it means can mean a kind of horse, it can mean um, big, the root word means run, so like running or jogging is biegać. So it means all of these different things, but actually in this specific context, it means something that no nobody else really knew about, that Olga had found in her research as she was working on this book, um, which was an 18th century Russian Orthodox sect, um, which believed that you had to remain in constant motion in order to escape the devil. So they were called Miguni. 
So I thought and thought about how to translate that. Someone else had proposed runners. It was sort of listed in a catalog of new Polish literature as runners. And I went with that working title for a while, but I never really liked it. And I also at the same time was kind of um, with increasing desperation approaching publishers in the United States because I thought this was just such an amazing work and nobody agreed with me. So I, you know, I went to meeting after meeting, I sent email after email, I published all these excerpts in good magazines and people kind of liked the shorter pieces of the novel, but they kept telling me in terms of pub <clears throat> in terms of publishing the book that it would be too confusing for American readers. Um, nobody would really understand it or nobody would get interested in it because it doesn't really have a clear hook. It doesn't have suspense in the way that we want a novel to have suspense. And nonetheless, I kept going as I was also working on other things. So one year passed, two years passed, three years passed, 10 years passed before I was able to get this book published. Finally, um, an editor of a brand new press in the United Kingdom um, responded to an email that I had sent him two years prior and said that he was really interested in publishing Olga Tokarczuk's novel, Runners. So I sat down to finish the translation and I came to the story, the title story, which was Beguni, or maybe Runners. And I translated the first page and I'm going to read what I uh, what I wrote for that, and it really kind of finally allowed me to click into place everything I needed for this philosophy of everything is untranslatable. If what translation means is making something new that stays the same, but that's not what translation is. Okay, so this is the passage. Over the world at night, hell rises. The first thing that happens is it disfigures space. It makes everything more cramped and more massive and unscalable. Details disappear and objects lose their features, becoming squat and indistinct. How strange that by day they may be spoken of as beautiful or useful. Now they look like shapeless bodies, hard to guess what they'd be for. Everything is hypothetical in hell. All that daytime heterogeneity of form the presence of colors, shades, reveals itself to be utterly in vain. What purpose could possibly be served by beige upholstery, by floral wallpaper, by tassels? What difference does green make to a dress slung over the back of a chair? It's difficult to understand the covetous gaze that fell upon it as it clung to its hanger in the shop window. There are no buttons or hooks or clasps now. Fingers in the dark find only vague bulges, rough patches, lumps of hard matter. The next thing hell does is drag you out of sleep. You can kick and scream, hell is implacable. Sometimes it provides disturbing images, frightening or mocking. A decapitated head, a beloved body covered in blood, human bones and ashes. Yes, yes, hell likes to shock. But more often than not, it awaits without standing on ceremony. Your eyes open onto darkness, launching a stream of consciousness. Your gaze aimed at nothing is its advanced guard. The nocturnal brain is a Penelope unraveling the cloth of meaning diligently woven during the day. Sometimes it's a single thread, sometimes more. Complex designs break down into prime factors, warp and weft. Weft falls by the wayside and only straight parallel lines remain, the barcode of the world. Then you realize, night gives the world back its natural, original appearance without sugarcoating it. Day is a flight of fancy, light a slight exception, an oversight, a disruption of the order. The world, in fact, is dark, almost black, motionless and cold. And what I realized is that something that was even more important then the word biaguni itself was Olga's ability to connect disparate ideas in a kind of subterranean way that is almost imperceptible, but that accumulates power over the course of a long work like this. 
So by rhyming flight with light and slight and oversight, it hit me that actually the word for this is flights because the book is all about travel. It's about fleeing people who have to flee their homes, which also anticipates Olga's next novel, The Books of Jacob, which is all about that. Um, and flights of fancy, it's all flights of fancy. That's the entire novel. And um, it was published as flights and it went on as mentioned to win the Booker Prize, which is the most important prize for English language translations. And um, then Olga won the Nobel Prize. So I was able about a year ago to join her in Stockholm to pick up that. Um, and yeah, all is well that ends well, but it is kind of an untranslatable word. But then again, every word is and is not.